Here, you can exercise your rights to freedom every day without leaving your home. We don't just say, we do. It's the Stay in City way. Hello and welcome to Real Talk with myself, Anelim Doda. Imagine the worst mistake you have ever made in your life. And imagine being defined by it for the rest of your life. Where do you begin to make amends and is it possible to rewrite your story? That's the question we are reflecting on for Day of Reconciliation. My two guests today, both from different backgrounds, made bad decisions that would haunt them for years to come. Theirs is a story of drugs, violence, guilt, innocence, and ultimately forgiveness. One of them is Mulemo Jubjub Marhanye. You'll get to hear his uh, story later on in the show, but right now, Reggie Karam has written a book about his life as a petty criminal and a drug user, and how the wrong choices he made would have devastating consequences for himself and his family. Through his memoir, Reggie Karam has shows that it's possible to rewrite your life and correct the wrongs in your past. His memoir, Innocence of Guilt, tells a story of tragedy, remorse, and second chances. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So <laughs> off the bat, I want to read. What, and what I like is you wrote your own, your own blurb in your book. Uh, yes. <laughs> you might do it. You might do it. And I loved it as soon as I read it. It says, as a retired accountant, uh, not an author or writer, I was nagged by my children who kept saying, Dad, you have a story, so tell it. So I decided to tell my story. We all have a story to tell, and this is mine. And I mean, I finished this in one day. So it is like a riveting story. And there was a point I couldn't believe it was actually somebody's life, right? And when, you, when your kids nag you to tell you this story, I mean, this, this is some, some brutal stuff going on in here. When did you tell your kids about your life? Well, you know, when they were growing up and became adults, they met people and who are you? Well, I'm Reggie Karam's daughter or I'm a Karam. And, you know, I just felt that they needed to know what and happened from in you. my life. And from me, direct from the source. Uh. And uh, I mentioned a few incidents, but I f felt I had to do the whole thing. And uh, that's why I started. I got inspiration from my faith. Yeah. And uh, I sat down and as I said, I'm not a writer and I didn't have notes. It was just purely from memory. Mm. And uh, that's what I did. I just sat down and wrote. You have an amazing memory because this book is vivid, it is clear, and it takes us and puts us right in Mayfair, uh, where you grew up. And the one phrase that was well known in Mayfair was, don't mess with the caroms. That's correct. Don't yes. mess with the caroms. <laughs> why? why? Why was that a thing? Well, you know, in our young days, well, I was still much younger. I was about five or six years old when my brothers were a lot older than I was. And being Lebanese, we were sort of looked at as not in the same class. Mm. And uh, we had to, well, my brothers at that stage had to defend themselves against rude, mm. crude remarks and things mm. like that. So they had to defend themselves physically this is why my father also put us all in the boxing ring mm. when we were kids. Mm. And uh, we, we, we stood up to everything <laughs> that was thrown yeah. at us. <laughs> you threw around a few punches in exactly. your life. Exactly. And we ended up with this reputation that uh, don't mess around with the Kerams. But I'm, this reputation, it, it did serve in your favor for a very long time. It did, yeah. definitely, definitely. I mean, people yes. would, don't mess with the Kerams. You know, it, people would think twice about... You, even racial attacks, you know, against exactly. Afrikaans people, it was like, hey, let's not, let's not try that family. Yeah, well, you see, you know, they, they regarded us as Syrians. Yeah. They called us, that, which was degrading at the time. Yeah. Because Syria had invaded Lebanon, Lebanon. and they were in, in, in control. And it was a sort of a, it wasn't the right thing in our, you know, for mm. our parents, our grandparents and so on. So it was, a, it was an insult. Mm. And uh, we had to stand up against it. You had to stand up against it. And it was abused. It was, you know, we were bullied. Mm. 
and uh, the attitude was before we get bullied, we're going to bully. Mm. You know what I yeah. mean? And because there's right. a lot of times in the book where I feel like there, there didn't need to be a fight and there didn't need to be guns pulled out and knives, but you know, you guys would just walk into a place and already you, you would be on the attack. Exactly. Did you find that you were, you were starting a lot of the fights? Like, yes, maybe our uh, uh, attitude and, uh, and, ah. uh, and the way we, you know, uh, arrogance, you could put it down to a bit of arrogance and ego and so on. And uh, we were expecting something, so we might as well bring it out into the <laughs> open. You know? <laughs> that type like, of thing. I'm going to start something before you start something. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. So your brothers kind of grew out of the violent nature, right? Yes. And the notorious nature. That's correct. And yet yeah. you remained in it. But there's... In the book, I get the sense that whilst you were in it, you didn't think you were entirely in it. So your intent wasn't to be there, but you were there, mm -hmm. right? Was this a way of convincing yourself that you are still a good person? Well, um, yes. Mm. You know, deep down, I knew I was a good person. Mm. I mean, I had a good upbringing, or right, a little bit of conflict along the way, but nothing serious, you know? A mm. bit of punch-ups and things like that. And uh, I felt, I'm not a bad person. Why am I doing these things, mm. you know? Why did I get caught up? I was like caught up in this wave mm. of loyalty and a bit of eager and arrogance and toughness, you know, mm. being respected. And uh, it just got the better of me. Mm. And obviously meeting up with guys who we grew up together as kids. We played in the sports field and things like that. We sort of clicked together in a way, but it just went all out of proportion. Mm. You know, it just grew and went in wrong directions. If we only could channel that energy and what we had into the right direction, you know, we would have been successful maybe in some other yeah. way of life. You know what I mean? And you were the wise owl in the, in the group, right? <laughs> That's what you're called because you, you were the think tank. If you didn't think the situation would tank. Exa <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why that was named Wise Al. Yeah. Wise Al. And mm. I felt like, you know, you, it validated you. You know, it, it gave you a sense of belonging. Which, if you look at the book, you've got such a strong sense of family that I don't know where, where the murky water comes in where you need to belong when you already belong to such a, to such a family that's, that kind of surrounds you when you're in trouble. Yeah, but I, I lost a bit of that. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, I lost that family connection. Mm. You know, although it was there in deep down, but this, this other wave that took over sort of took control. And uh, the family connection was second best. Mm. You know, I was hunted down by my older brothers. I was hurting my mother and my sisters and the rest of the family. And it didn't seem to bother me, you know. I, I was just on this wave of destruction and, and uh, uh, I just couldn't help myself at the time. And of course, drugs. Mm. Drugs made the thing a lot worse. It made me lose responsibility. It made me lose whatever I felt was right. Mm. Drugs made it, made it disappear, you know what I mean? Mm. Did you ever, in and because you, you don't write this in your book, you, when you said your brothers would look for you and they would, you know, and obviously your brothers were, don't mess with the parents, you yes. know? Mm. In your altercations with your brothers about the life that you have chosen of gangsterism, did you ever point the finger back at them and say, I watched you guys growing up. No. This violent nature is something that you introduced me to. No, no. Never. Never, never, never. And it never crossed your mind that uh, that, that was it? Not, my bro not from my brothers. Mm. It came from other things, other, uh, you know, the people at the time, like, as I mentioned, at the movie house when, you know, it was Elvis Presley movie and we were shoved to the back of the queue. And by, the, by the older guys. By the older yeah. guys. And this, this was against the grain. I don't like that. You know yeah. what I mean? So I had to show a bit of power as well. Uh. And that grew in me as well, you know. That uh, uh, influenced me to a great extent. When, when you have to talk to, you know, to, I don't want to say the youth. I, I don't like the, the youth today. But when you have to talk to, the, you know, younger generations than you, 
Because w w when I look at you and, and I know your story, the, the, line, the line is so thin between you being in gangsterism and you being on, on the straight and narrow and following your accounting dreams. You know, what's that line to look out for? What, what do you say? Because it, for you, it was, you could have been on either side permanently, actually. Yes, you know, it's the choices you make. You know, you always got choices, and uh, there's good, there's bad. Don't, don't, don't sit on the fence. Don't sit on the fence. And you did sit which on the I fence. Which I did. I sat on the fence, yeah. You did. Sit and on instead the fence. of falling on the right side, I fell onto the wrong side, uh. because the enticement was there, the temptation was there, of blasé. You know what uh. I mean? On this side was the righteousness, you want to call it. Yeah. Or doing the right things. I mean, we're not never going to be perfect, of course, but uh, it's the choices you make. And I would, I would warn the youth, if you want to call them <laughs> that, that <laughs> don't take chances. You know, do some soul searching, realize what's right, what's wrong. Pick and a side. Pick a side. And remember, there's consequences. Eh? Yeah. You know, sometimes you forget there's consequences. Mm. You know, you just think, oh, I'll do it and I'll get away with it, and oh, so what, and you know, but there are real consequences. Yeah, but yo, you guys up. were living a life of no consequences, eh? Like I say, it's like a movie, this book, I promise you. So getting mixed up with the wrong gang would be the worst decision Reddy, Reggie would make. Uh, his stubborn vanity, misplaced loyalty to the wrong crowd, in particular Dennis Holmes, would cost him dearly, ending with the murder of his brother. We continue this story right after the break. Reggie Karam's book, Innocence of Guilt, is a compelling story of how choosing the life of drugs and gangsterism led to the murder of his brother and finding in himself the courage to forgive those who committed the crime and ultimately to forgive himself. So what demons did you have to face the most when you were writing this book? Because, I mean, now you must replay everything which led to your brother's murder. The demon, the, the strongest demon that I was facing was that my brother was portrayed as a drug lord. Mm, Johnny. Johnny. Mm. He was the most innocent guy in this whole thing. He had got divorced. He's, um, he was going through a bit of uh, depression, I would say. Mm. And I brought these guys into his life. And he, he took them in as friends, you know, not knowing because friends of my brother are friends, friends of mine. Friends of my brother, friends yeah. of my, and I'm the younger brother. Yeah. And uh, he, he took them in and he treated them well. And, and for him to be then taken out and portrayed as, as what he was, mm. that was my biggest demon because he was actually trying to save me. He was counseling me, he was counseling the two the girls, two girls Irma. that came yeah. along there. And, uh, and, and that's what I say, he, he was portrayed right, not in the right space. Mm. And, and that was my biggest uh, demon at, at mm. the time. So, you know, when, you, when you're relaying the story, you, you ask a lot of questions, and the questions are for yourself. It's, why am I attracted to this life? Why does Dennis have such a hold on me? Why am I giving the power to him? Uh, is he so manipulative, or is it us that are you know, needing a leader. These, now, these questions are hindsight in the book. Whilst you were growing up and whilst you were in that situation, were you asking yourself these questions? Yeah, you, the way you put it, uh, there was questions asked. Yeah. But, um, you know, as I say, we, we grew up together and I knew where he came from. He had a, he had a, a difficult upbringing mm. in the early stages. And I was aware of this, and I thought he needed someone to to um, show a bit of feeling for him, a bit of care, you know? Mm. I wouldn't say love, mm. but someone who cared about who he was and what he was. And uh, that sort of made me think that he, I was on his level, he was on my level, you know? Mm. But uh, I didn't work out that way, and I gave him that power unknowingly because deep down I pitied him in a way as well. 
And unknowingly, he was using my kindness as a weakness. Mm. Do you think your, your father passing away when you were 11 years old is, is, is why you were hell-bent on always being kind to other people because you lost your soldier, you know? Your, your dad was an amazing dad who provided for you guys and was present and, you know, kind of molded the family. So you say that you, you wanted to show, you know, you know, Dennis that love that you came from. And then you lose your dad. Was the, that gaping hole, is that why you, you you wanted to fix other people? Because you were avoiding fixing yourself. I was trying to fix myself at the same time. Mm. You know, I thought, this is the way of fixing myself. Fixing other people, I'll be fixing myself. But I was, I wasn't strong enough. Mm. You know, I, I, I weakened. Mm. And although, you know, I was brought up in a, in a, in a home with religious, Catholic home, strong Catholic beliefs and all that. It sort of just disappeared and drugs. Drugs. <laughs> Again, drugs. Drugs. Yeah. Um, you know, the two girls that were, were living with, with, with Reggie, I'm not Reggie, with, 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 with Dennis. Yes. Um, when, when I was reading about them and then, you, then later, at a later stage, I learned that you had three daughters. Because I was, I was, I was, I was, I was wondering, you know, are you glad you didn't have sons because of how you turned out and how Dennis was and how Barry was and how Tensa was. You know, are you glad you didn't have sons or are, are you glad you have daughters so that you can teach them not to be, you know, th like those girls that ended up in, un under the, 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 the control of someone like Dennis? Actually, I, I, didn't, I didn't cross my mind about having a son. Uh. I didn't cross my mind. I just, what God gave me, I accepted and mm. did my best for them. Mm. Yeah, it's a, Obviously, my brother Johnny had two girls, yeah. and uh, and he was very concerned that there was these two young girls being treated like this. What happens if it was my daughters? You know what I mean? Mm. And that's what also made him so strong in his counselling to me. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I've got girls. Mm. Look what they're doing to these girls. Do something about it. And what did I do? Too late. Mm. When I started doing something, it was too late. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. Is it Tansy? Tansy. Tansy. Mm. So Tansy is the one who pulled the trigger that killed your brother. That's correct, yes. Although manipulated and masterminded by Dennis. By Dennis. Who then, who then turned state witness. But all of this you'll find out in the book. The, the, you know, the premise of today's show is forgiveness. And... You know, like I say, the book is riveting and I absolutely loved it. But for me, when I got goosebumps and my body went cold, is when you meet up with the, with the man who pulled the trigger, Tansy. And you don't know whether you're going to forgive him or not. And he embraces and you guys hug and he whispers in your ear, Reg, please forgive me. <laughs> you know, for years, after I, I, I got married and I had children and things like that, and I, you know, I went on this, uh, the... Um, Soul searching. The soul searching and the, and the, the Alpha course yeah. that the church introduced. You know, I, I found a relief somewhere along the line, forgiveness for myself. Yeah. But now I had to deal with knowing this guy's going to come out one day. Mm. And I know I'm going to meet him. Mm. Somewhere. He's Lebanese, his family. I'm going to meet him somewhere. How will I deal with it? I had two options. Either I can kill him, mm. which that evil th thought in me was turning yeah. over, or I forgive him. And how could I could forgive him? Because he killed my brother. So this turned over for many years. Although I sort of blocked it out mm. because I was with family, friends, and you know, all that type of thing. And then this came about so sort of suddenly, you know, I knew all the time I was going to see him again or meet up with him again. And I thought, well, look, let's just see. Let, let me give him a chance. Let's mm. see what he's, how he's going to approach me. Mm. You know, if he's still this blase guy who thinks he's king of the world, you know what I mean? We'll and he, you know, because sometimes people come out of jail after they did something and they think they, they own the world, you know what I mean? So... I really don't want us to spill any more 
about this book because I want people to go and get it and I want them to read it themselves. The book is called The Innocence of Guilt. Uh, it's by Reggie Karam. What a riveting book. Thank you for your story. Thank you for your story of forgiveness. Reggie has since rebuilt his life with a career and a renewed commitment to family and marriage through his story. Uh, though his story reads like something from a fiction, like I said, it's like a movie. It can be healing for somebody. Make sure you get the book. It's gripping. It's powerful. It's fascinating. When we return from the break, we track down the story of another young man whose reckless choices takes him on the wrong side of the law, and he's now asking the nation to forgive him. Mulimo Jubjub Maruhanye is on the other side of this. About 22 years ago, he captured the nation's heart in a commercial as a young starstruck soccer fan, excited at meeting his soccer hero, Dr. Kumalo. He would enchant us with his sweet, innocent face, those big brown eyes. He was the ultimate child star who would land more commercials, television gigs, presenting on KTV, Jam Ali, and Channel O. He became the first South African to land a scholarship at the renowned fame school, La Guardian High School for the Performing Arts in New York, and became an entertainer with a flourishing music career. He went on to release music, but indeed, Kokele did something even more game-changing for him, making him the ultimate crossover artist. But on the 8th of March, 2010, everything changed, and he's here to share his story. Ladies and gentlemen, Mulimo Jub. Welcome to Real Talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Ah, actually, I want to call you the Jube because yeah. I heard from a little bit that your friends call you the Jube. So you know. Okay. I was like, I want him to be my friend. So. I, heard, I heard from the passage as well. The ants. So I'm gonna call you the ants. The ants. The ants. It's actually Ace. <laughs> okay, Ace. It makes you sound like a soccer player, though, ne? Yeah. Hanyan. And I not like being different. Everybody that says about it, the Ace, never get the ants. The ants. Because I copy and then I get the ads and you'll know who it then is. I'll know. Okay, okay I get cool. then it is right. settled. I right. am the ants. Sure. You lived every child's dream in that Coca-Cola ad with Doctor. That's when he he was taken off the field and then he was walking through the tunnel and you yeah. were like, Doctor. Yeah, do you and need any help? He gave him the Coke and then yeah. I got us and then he gave you his jersey. Yes, yes. Beautiful, beautiful ad. I, I used to say to my mom, Mommy, how did the child get there? How did that child get there? Uh, it was mommy. Mommy took me to a casting agent. And uh, just like anybody else, I went for the audition. Mm -hmm. And I was shortlisted, chosen, and then I got the job. What were you doing in your household that gave your mom like, like little hints that this child is done, man, this child is done? Very hyperactive. Uh -huh. I was very, very hyperactive. Um, I also went to remedial school. So I think my hyperactivity kind of sparked it off for them because I was excelling more in sports mm. than uh, academically. Uh, yeah. But they didn't see that as a problem for them. It was nah, like, look, nah, let, then let's nah, hone in on nah. that It side. actually worked for me. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, what's this that your parents made you pay for your school fees? Where? When you were younger, using your, your gig money. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't know about that. None of that? No, nah, I don't know about that. They actually saved it all for me and set me up much later on in life. Okay. Mm. So did you get to a point when you, were, you knew that a gig is yours? Like... I've got this because we can't deny your star quality, mm. you know. And like, like I was talking about your eyes, like there's just something very like inviting about your eyes, and that's how TV is sold. Mm. If you, I mean, you know this. Mm -hmm. So, did you would you get to a point and be like, I've got this one, even before you get it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think somewhere, somewhere, but I used to get a whole lot of butterflies. I used to get shook every time. Every time. And you know, you would always practice and practice. Just as they drop you off now, you have to like skip a line of like 30 people, 100 people waiting to get in. Yeah. And then I go in there, and then now I'm starting to get cold feet and stuff. So as much as I was confident, but at the same time, you know, I was a bit shook. But mm. most of the times, yeah, you're right. Mm. I knew I knew. You yeah, yeah, yeah like you're right. You're right. <laughs> this, this, yeah. this is in the bag. Yeah. Now, the thing about us entertainers is that you can hear. 10,000 compliments, but mm. one negative mm. is the one Messes that's up gonna, everything, yeah. Right, and it's yeah. the one that's going to stick with you. Yeah, and you'd rather focus on that than the positive stuff. Than the positive yeah, stuff. Yeah, because you feel like that negative comment would, you know. What is it about us? Is, is it the fact that we, we it's almost like you want to turn them into, in, 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 into fans because 
you, you feel like your talent is, is that big and that good that you know, they, they are misguided and, and not liking what you do. You're like, don't worry, I'll convince you I'm good. I think, I think, I think we, get, we get caught up too much into it that we want everything to be perfect. So the moment they say, yeah, mother, da, you should have, you know, da, you should have, then you're thinking, hey, forget all the good that I've done. Mm. Let me go focus on that bad one, mm. you know? And when you focus on that bad one, that's when we mess up. Because there's like 45 positive ones and there's, this, there's just this one negative one, but why not you want to focus on that one, which really doesn't make a difference. But Do you think it ever leaves you? Personally, for me, it doesn't. Oh. And a wise man always told me that, um, you know, when you have that feeling mm. of fear, stage fright, and s you, you know, uh, or before you you, you stand in front, yeah, 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 before you stand in front of a crowd or or whatnot, if you don't feel that, then you've lost it all. But for as long as you feel that, mm. then you still have it in you, mm. because that means you're not comfortable. I hear what you're saying. No, yeah. no. Yeah. I did like, you know, if the butterflies stop, then mm. go do something else. Do you, yeah, there was a time when I was like, hey, man, guys, Mara Jub Jub, like, life is just, like, grand for him. W were you not in Verbal Assassin? No. <laughs> you weren't in Verbal no, Assassin? No, I Never. Uh -uh. You weren't in that, like, highlight. No. But you were in hip-hop and you were in rapper. Yeah. Yeah. I was always rolling solo. Okay. I was never part of a crew or a squad or anything, I was always rolling solo, you know? And I think there was always a lot of people that grew up as well in our era, they mm. always thought I was part of the Infinity and all of that, you know, the Lee Club gang. Yes. And, you know, the Amos and all of that. And, uh, you know, being actually younger than Amo and stuff, but I mean, being the it kid, I was never really part of a crew. I rolled solo. I'm so glad you said the it kid because, mm. like, every time I saw you, it just looked like this kid's life. Mm. Like, everything's great. Were you also in that? Were you wake up and you're like, life is good? <laughs> 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 Was that you? Yeah, I did feel like that, no doubt. And I'm not going to lie about it. Yeah. So, would you say that that, <clears throat> that came to an abrupt stop with the, with the accident? Or was it, were there things before happening where you, like, Ah, man, what's going on with my life? Oh, no, everything changed. Ne? Everything changed there. Everything changed. It wasn't like that. And I mean, I could never say, you know, wake up and say life was good after that because I lost a part of me as well. So, you know, everything changed there. And I'd imagine that even if, and I have no doubt that life, because you're very talented, mm. and, you know, there's many things you can, you can take away from people. <laughs> you can take away... You know, you can take away money, you can take away gigs, you can take away friends, you can mm. take away houses, but mm. talent is something you can't yeah. take away. Yeah. So this is why I'm saying that, yeah. like, I have no doubt that yeah. we're going to see a lot of you and your talent. Yeah. But are you, are you hesitant now of how you smile, how you celebrate, how you enjoy your talent, how you express your talent? Because there's always someone like, oh, when, when, willow. No. 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 Right now, no. I've got no reason to do that because the moment you do that, you're showing fear to people, mm. you know? And the moment you do that, you're showing them that you care about what they say. Mm. Right now, I've never walked so confidently with God. It's crazy, you know? It's so amazing. And, you know, walking confidently with him. You know, I've lost a lot of friends. I've lost a lot of family too. Mm. You know, I've lost people that I thought would never leave me. Yeah. And, but there's just this one spirit that's with me and says, listen, you got every reason right now to walk tall. Mm -hmm. uh, smile if you feel you want to smile. Cry if you feel you want to cry. Rejoice, mm. glorify whenever. There's nothing wrong about it. Do you understand? Mm. So I guess I'm more confident now because I guess I've seen life both sides. Mm. Yeah. You, my uncle went to jail and when he came back, he was such a hugger. Mm. Are, you, are you a hugger? You appreciate. You ne? appreciate <laughs> people. You appreciate family more. You appreciate everything that was taken away from you. And he was you. so distant before. Like, yes. Now he's just like, he's like, how are you? Yes. You're like, okay, yes. okay, okay, yes. okay, okay, yes. okay. You appreciate more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, food. Mm. What food do you appreciate yo, more? Yo, <laughs> you want to take it there? Dude, because I'm a lover of food, so listen, I want to know. Listen, man, when I, you're talking about when I came out, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I went from, can I mention them? Yeah. 
Yo, 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 yo. I went from Hodu to Stam. We are more of a thing, Jan. I went from Hodu to Stam. I went from everything. I had a list on some, I need to eat this, I need to eat this. Then I come out. Then my role manager's like, hey, whatever, there's a new spot that just opened. Now I need to go and eat that and taste mm. that and taste that. Mm. I was craving for McDonald's. I was craving for McDonald's. Then I heard that, okay, Burger King now is here. I was like, what? Give me the burger. Here I am now comparing burgers, you know? Eating them so at the same time. At the same time. <laughs> you know, I'm also laying up the cheese and stuff, you know? <laughs> it was all good. I really, really, really loved it. And I went back to the old spot where I would buy a mangrena, especially when it would come late yeah. from partying and stuff. So to get some of that and stuff. So at one point I got really, really sick. Yeah, because yeah. your system's not used to it. Yeah, Listen, well. I'm pretty sure after all of that, now you are a little bit hungry. So here's the deal. I'm going <laughs> to give you about two to three minutes. Go grab a little snack and then <laughs> come back. Chup Chup is not going anywhere. I will be right back after this. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Khatas Kiri Poso Tsakiri Yen Zing. The Kele di Taka de Rota Kili Chanka Ning. Kikenzo Matate, one Tasiri Ting. My life was too fast, five two Huyari Heling. Blindfolded by the good life and pressure, killing my cheating. Luna Bataung, Babo Hale, Bang Shepiling. You hold the moon, the Fatsing, you know, Nabaki Batsepiling. Begging for your forgiveness, Lord, I can't deal with the silence. Standing before you, Dolo, all I need from you was guidance. Why ain't you let my killer step in cold, riding reckless? Thought I was doing best, just living life to the fullest, stressless. Oh, try to lock on to my finance. I'm grateful for the second chance, now I know where my life stands. With the purpose, just wanna tie up all the loose ends, no more wrong turns. I just hoping this ain't my last yes. Jube is out on parole and he's asking South Africa to give him a second chance in a song he wrote while still inside Lugo Prison, Kiko Patuarello. He's our guest today, Jube Jube, and we're chatting atonement, forgiveness, and second chances. So when I was watching the, the trial, right, I was like, why is your hair always so done properly all the time? Like, in my, in my mind, like, it's just, it's too neat. Like, it's like... The chap guys, like looking out there, <laughs> looking like a superstar. This is no place to look like a superstar. Uh, it was my only crit for you. Did uh, you get that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. And I when did. people said that to you, what did you say? Uh, I mean, I was never dirty. Am I supposed to be dirty or no, scruffy? No, you were never dirty. You know, scruffy. I, I've never. I, I, I don't believe in looking scruffy. You know. You know what I always believe in? What matters? My. Uh, <laughs> My dad once said to me, if you want to see what kind of man he is, look at his shoes. Uh -huh. Do you understand? You could be wearing rags and rags and rags. As long as your shoes are clean, yeah. you look decent enough. I had hair at that time, so I made sure that the shoes and the hair was clean. Then the rags, I didn't have a problem with yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, with shoes, it's not like you made the shoes. You yeah. put them on and you went to. Yeah. For me, just like the hairstyle, the pristine detail, you know, the zigzags yeah. and the, yeah. it just looked like, I was like, you sat down somewhere, you're like, yes, and for me, well, I was I like. Well, I always designed my hairstyles, yeah. But also, I felt like, and this is my judgmental yeah, side, yeah. you don't have to, like, you know, to, yeah. to subscribe to it. Mm. It was just like, that's not where you should have been putting your focus. Mm. And what other crit were you getting at that time? Um, hey, there was a lot. Ne? There was a lot. I mean, people had a lot to say. And the funny thing is that the people that had a lot to say, they forget that in their own homes, there's a storm, mm. do you understand? And um, I got used to it, you know, but if Jesus had a whole lot of people, you know, uh, throwing stones and insulting him and criticizing him, who am I, mm. you know? So just to go through it and whatnot. But um, then again, it's court, you know? If you don't look clean, the court will say, you don't look clean. Mm. If you look clean, they criticize you. So either or, whether I was doing right or I was doing wrong, I was always on the firing line mm. at court, you know? Mm. Yeah, so. Have you forgiven yourself? 
I have. I have. And I think that's what keeps me going. Uh, yeah. You know, when you speak to a therapist and when, you, when you're going through a process of forgiving yourself, the, the key is to hit rock bottom, right? And to sit in your, in your darkness. Mm -hmm. When was that for you? Inside and outside. Ne? Yeah, inside and outside. When it's outside, is this before you went inside or? Outside, this is now. Oh, yeah, okay. This is now. Inside, just before I came out. Or my whole time. Yeah. Yeah. A apparently you get used to prison. Did you ever get used to it? Nah. Look, I don't know where you're getting your stories <laughs> from. <laughs> no, no, prison, no. That you will get used to prison if you go in and out of prison. Uh -huh. And you know, the most unfair thing in life is that you have people, homeless people, mm -hmm. that are sleeping under bridges. And uh, inside, we have what we call pumapaga. You know, mm. puma paga meaning get out of the cell, we are paga for mahala. Mm. So outside, there's none of that. In order for you to eat, you need to do crime. Mm. So a homeless person prefers to be in prison. So that person would say, uh, you get used to prison, you know, but um, if you're not a criminal and you've worked hard in your life and you're uh, your goal was never to sit in a prison cell, isolated from everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think being that person, you would say that... You get used to it. You get used to it, you know? Mm. Yeah. It comes into your mind every day about your life. You know, like something that, even like at 5 to 12, you think to yourself, oh man, I'd almost made it another day without thinking about it. And here it is, it's in my head, and it, it's, it's my DNA, it's who I am. It's not, what do you mean, it's who I am? As in, because, you know, you could replay, you could be replaying the car accident in your head every day, mm -hmm. you know? You could be replaying, you know, the, the song that was playing before the car accident. You could be replaying you putting on the clothes that morning, you know? There's mm -hmm. something about that day that, you, you're not going to replay the entire day for the entire day, but there's a moment in the day mm -hmm. that you will always remember, and I want to know what that moment is. When you wake up in the morning, the sun is bright. Come the time when I have to go to the meeting, usually when the sun sets mm. at 6.30, I remember the sun setting at past three on that day. So that's what I remember. I remember how everything got dark right in the middle of the day. I had it all good, man. It was all good. Everything was nice. Mm. And then like, I had a good upbringing, good family. Everything was nice. And everything just went dark, like literally dark. Literally dark. Everything I had, gone. Everyone I knew, gone. Nobody wanted to be associated with Jupe Jupe. Brand association, this, that, yeah, yeah. People, you know, saying this and that. and. I thought, you know what, the most important thing right now, it's not even about them, I don't care about them. The most important thing right now is Jupe. Mm. What the f did you just do? You know? And that's what I remember. And, you know, now when I do music, there's more to music than before. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. Um, my music is all about emotion, you know, and speaking to the hearts of people and generalizing. Now I literally have to take people on a journey through my music without me even noticing it. See how scary it is? So um, it's become a part of me. And it becoming a part of me now I'm in a situation of, okay, you messed up. You did this. God has given you a second chance. What now? And 
rather than focusing on the negative and the past. And the mistakes that I've done, I'd rather go out there and, 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 and do good, you know? Because not a lot of people are given a second chance. Mm. Yeah. Do good and be good, ne? Mm -hmm. So listen, whilst you mull over what you've just heard, I think that was a test of many if I've ever heard one before, we're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, this talent and this music that he speaks about now that he's doing on a whole on a whole nother level with God, we're gonna hear it. Come back. And we're back, you're watching Real Talk with Anele, and we are in a deep conversation with Muli Mojub Jub Maruhanye. He has rewritten and continues to rewrite his life through music, first releasing Gikupa Tarla and now Shooting Star. Uh, you have to appreciate this hashtag though. Things Jub Jub doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come on, right? Yeah. Okay, did you know that the Blackberry doesn't support WhatsApp anymore? No, you didn't. <laughs> no, you yeah. didn't. <laughs> okay, did you know that it was possible filling up the dome as well as F&B Stadium? Yeah. Okay, did you know that Generations is now Generations, the legacy? Nope. Ah, Jubes, that's, no. you must catch up. Uh, did you know that we have something called Instagram where everyone pretends to be rich? Yeah, official underscore Jube Jube. What's up? Okay, so official underscore Jube Jube. That's yeah. you on Instagram and on Twitter. Yeah, everywhere. Okay, did you know that there's a Shabin in Saxon World? Oh. <laughs> no, I remember. No, I read no, about no. it. Did you read about it? Oh, yeah. what's this? Please don't give I, us. Oh, no, right. no, no, yeah, no, but don't I, do that. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and before you perform, uh, have you seen Kelly Kumalo since you've been out? No, that's a non fact. I don't talk no, about you that. You don't talk about no, that? No, no, no. Okay. No. And your child? For the respect of my champ. Champ. Um, okay. You know, um, I want him to grow just like any other normal kid. So I don't want to talk about my champ, but daddy loves you, man. <laughs> called him your champ. Yeah, that's my okay. champ. That's your champ. Yeah. It is painful and difficult, but it is possible to forgive. Second chances can happen, but remember, you need to forgive yourself too. What an absolute pleasure it's been chatting to Jube Jube and of course, Reggie Karam. Thank you for watching and we're sending you off the, to the weekend with Jube Jube's awesome latest song. It's called Awesome God. He does it with his cousin, Bono Kushe. What a talent. For myself and the team, we'll see you next time. And now for the performance. Through the storm and through the rain And everything that I've been through You stay the same and I know your name My God is an awesome God My God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven above with wisdom God is an awesome God My God is an awesome God He reigns from heaven He breathes every mind and he can see you from behind. Even though you try to hide, you wanna go on my side. You ain't gotta have no pride. Could it change a thousand miles? True story, no lies. It was a blessing in disguise. Anyone can prophesy, but bank will better maximize. But bank lawyer multiplied. On the faith I was supplied, like my numbers don't divide. COD had to provide. I chose to survive. I was in the concrete jungle, surrounded by the big five. Roll a dice, six five. It gave me fun and a life. I cannot stress about the doubt because my breath is more than life, baby. Oh.
full of faith. Got him no shame. Your promise always stays the same. Thank you for being there for me when it was real hard. Praying every day and never spending time apart. I went to jail and came back. It made me a better person. Went to hell and came back. You showed me that it was worth it. Super blessed. Nina Sam, my nigga, and cup is gone. Then in connected and some enemies wanna be now. I said, don't take yourself, son. Must put this is the slum. Thy kingdom come. Almighty me, now I want that scum. Oh, I'm so get in one. Just remember day one. I never turn my back and I'm gonna always stay down. Oh, 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 oh,